Okay, well, good morning. Thank you, Craig, and I want to thank all of you for being here so early on a foggy uh, uh, morning at 8 o'clock. We're going to talk a little bit about the state of farm labor in California, and then talk a little bit about what might happen under our new uh, president-elect. The main, the takeaway from this first picture is simply that the number of unauthorized foreigners in the United States has stabilized at roughly 11 million. And about 8 million of those unauthorized foreigners, about 60% are from Mexico, are in the labor force. So today, a work day, about 5%, one out of 20 people at work is an unauthorized foreigner. And on the right part of the top slide, you'll see what that has meant for agriculture, which is a bit like a canary in a coal mine. Roughly half employed in agriculture are unauthorized, a little higher in California, a little lower in the Midwest. And you can see that's the change in average hourly earnings. It bounced up and down. But in 2015, all the lines went up in California, Florida, and the United States. And in the bottom right, you see aging farmers, aging farm workers. So the, the main points I'm going to leave you with uh, today are, number one, Higher workers do most of the work in labor-intensive agriculture. What's labor-intensive agriculture? It's tree fruits and not so much raisin grapes, table grapes. It's vegetables and melons, and it's nursery products, flowers, mushrooms, etc. So higher workers do somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of the work in labor-intensive agriculture. The second thing is that those higher workers are primarily men born in Mexico. Roughly 70% men born in Mexico in the US, it's closer to 85, 90% in the state of California. The main takeaway, they're settled. They don't migrate around anymore. Many of them have US born children and they're getting older. The average age of all US workers is 42. The average age of farm workers is about 39. It used to be that the average age of US workers was 40, and the average age of farm workers was 25. The, the joke was a 40-40 rule. Hard to find a farmer who's under 40 because of the capital needed to get into agriculture. Hard to find farm workers over 40 because of the physical demands of farm work. That's changing. The 40-40 rule no longer applies. Farmers are still old, but farm workers are getting old as well. So what are people, what are farmers doing in response to fewer people coming from Mexico? And they're doing the four S things. I was a teacher for many years, still teach now and then. You're trying to satisfy current workers. How do you do that? People are not raising wages because they don't think higher wages are going to bring new people out. What they're doing instead is offering bonuses, sometimes retraining supervisors. Try to keep people in agriculture longer. Second, it's stretching workers. How do you stretch workers? Well, you schedule them better, but the real thing you do is give them things that increase their productivity. A good example is a conveyor belt out in the field. If we were in the Apple business, they're using hydraulic platforms so you don't have to go up and down the ladders as much. Try to take the current workers and make them more productive. The third, of course, is substitution. Machines wherever you can use them. Uh, there's some potential to switch crops, but we may have run out of the opportunities to go from raising grapes to almonds. And then finally, supplement the workforce with H2A guest workers. And we'll come back to, we'll talk about each of these in turn. But the fresh blood coming into agriculture used to be the new unauthorized worker from rural Mexico. Now it's the new H2A worker, still from Mexico. So the way in which I usually describe California agriculture, as you know, California has been the largest agricultural state since 1950, not because we have a lot of land, but because we grow high value crops. So what separates California from the rest is we have high farm sales because we grow high value fruits and vegetables and horticultural specialties. And most of US agriculture is half livestock, half crops. In California, we're mostly crops. So farm sales separate the state. The second is, is that labor share of production cost is really high. It averages about 30%. It goes to 40% or more in strawberries. Remember, in something like wheat or corn, the labor share of production cost 
is under 5%. So we have labor-intensive crops, and that means labor share, labor cost, wages and benefits are a big share of the total. And then finally, it's seasonality. Crops, if you have uh, uh, any kind of crop agriculture, more people are needed at some time than other times. For the state as a whole, we need 140 workers in August for every 100 workers employed in January. On an individual farm, as you go down geographically, that peak trough ratio goes up. So you might need 100 workers at the peak and only one in the off-season. So what makes California different? A lot of sales, high labor share, and seasonality. And you all know California produces a very high share of many of the commodities. And then what makes our labor market different? Well, our labor market is different for the three C's. We have concentrated production and concentrated employment. The largest 1,000 farm employers in this state hire about 70% of all the workers in the third quarter, which is the biggest quarter. So it's true, we have 25,000 farm employers paying into unemployment insurance, but the largest 1,000 really account for most of the employment in the state. We also have, we're, one of the, we're the only state in which most workers are brought to farms by non-farm employers. Who are those non-farm employers? The technical term is crop support services. The informal term is labor contractors or custom harvesters. So in this state since 2007, more workers are employed on crop farms who were brought there by these crop support services than were hired directly by farmers. And that's the, we're the only state in which such a large share of people come from intermediaries. And then the final point to make it symmetric is conflict. There's always conflict in labor markets. And the main takeaway for agriculture is we're an exit labor market. So a voice labor market is like working for the University of California. Nobody ever leaves. If you don't like something, you speak up and try to change it. An exit labor market is fast foods. If you don't like working at McDonald's, you go down the street for Burger King. It's roughly the same work. If you don't like picking strawberries on my farm, you go to the next farm. It's roughly the same work. Agriculture is an exit labor market. If you don't like where you are, you go hopefully to a non-farm job or to another farm job. What that means is, remember we've had unions, but it's really hard to form a stable union because who gets out first, who exits first? It's the best workers. It's always been that way. So in the state of California, we have roughly 420,000 average annual jobs. So what does that mean? We take a snapshot of employment every month, we sum them up, divide by 12, and that comes out to roughly 415,000 job slots. But if we take all the social security numbers that you guys report, and if we screen them for those now far fewer than used to be workers who had 60 employers in one quarter, there aren't as many of those as there used to be, we roughly find two workers per job slot. So there's a lot of people, a lot of unique individuals employed in agriculture sometime during the year. And one big question is, how could we reorganize or could we organize in a way to get more work out of each of those? The point I made a few minutes ago was, in 2005 and the third quarter was the first time we had more workers brought to farms by labor contractors that were hired directly. 2007 was when we had, on an average annual basis, more workers brought to farms by contractors than were hired directly. So who are those contractors? There's roughly 3,000 in the United States. About almost half of them are in California. They pay, remember, it's not just contractors. It's also custom harvesters. And the other thing to remember is some contractors, the big study we need to do is some contractors are essentially captives of one employer. So Ocean Mist has Valley Pride. Valley Pride provides labors to Ocean Mist. So it's essentially the same company, but they still come as a labor contractor. What we don't know is of those 1,400 contractors, how many of them work for just one or two employers? They're practically partners of the farm. How many are the stereotypical going from farm to farm? They're by far the biggest single payer of wages to agriculture. And they do a lot of seasonal jobs on farms, tree fruits is by far the biggest single employer of labor contractors. 
The, uh, and strawberries, in case you didn't know, is by far the biggest single employer of farm workers in this state. The rule of thumb is you need one and a half to two workers an acre, so we got 40,000 acres. That's somewhere between 60 and 70,000 workers. 20 years ago, the number one employer of workers would have been raising grapes. But now, somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of raising grapes are DOV, and we have far fewer workers there. Vegetables and melons do both direct hire and the uh, indirect hire through custom harvesters. And then if you take, there's five, there are about, the USDA says there's about 18 commodity groups. And in the state of California, 95% of farm labor is in five. Labor contractors, tree fruits, vegetables, nurseries, and dairy. That's basically farm labor and a lawful lot of agriculture. So the grains don't matter, the rice, the cotton, they really don't account for very, beef cattle don't account for much in the state of California. So who are the workers who do that work? Primarily men born in Mexico. Diane will talk more about this. But the takeaway message is that most of them have been in the United States at least eight or 10 years. A newcomer is defined as somebody who's employed in agriculture and has been in the United States less than a year. Back in 2000, at the peak of illegal immigration, almost a quarter of California worker, farm workers were newcomers. That means when they were interviewed doing farm work, they had been out of the country the year before. That's now 2%. Okay? We don't get new illegal workers coming into the state. And I already mentioned that they're aging, they're settled, they're married, they have US-born children. And it used to be that California hourly earnings, not the wages, but what people actually earn based on piece rates and everything, were always higher than in the rest of the United States. That California wage premium has disappeared, at least according to what workers say. Roughly, we're paying about the same as other workers. So the main takeaway message is farm work in this state is pretty much like non-farm work. You don't live on the farm where you work. You carpool to work and you have only one farm employer typically in the course of the year. Remember that one farm employer could well be a labor contractor, so you could work on five farms, but you're only getting one W-2 statement at the end of the year. The main message here is the red bars are the year 2000. The year 2000 was the peak of illegal migration from Mexico. That's when we had the peak of newcomers, that's when we had the peak of young workers, the only one that's different is married workers. You'll notice is the fourth row here, and there we have far more married farm workers with children now than we did back in 2000. The big question is, farm work, hired farm work, has always been a job, not a career. And the question is, how do farm employers slow the exits from agriculture? People are gonna get out of agriculture. It always has happened. People come in, they typically stay in less than 10 years, and then they move out of especially the seasonal agricultural workforce. The farm workers of tomorrow, if past con traditions continue, are growing up today somewhere outside the United States. And the big immigration debate over the last two decades has been how many hurdles does the government put between you and farm workers who grew up somewhere else? We'll talk a little bit about guest workers at the end. The other big thing that we don't talk about much at these meetings is the federal government spends a billion dollars a year helping farm workers and their children. What do they help them do? They help them get out of agriculture and in the case of the children, never start. Children of farm workers educated in the United States rarely follow their parents into the fields. Will that change? It's hard to tell. California farmers face a series of challenges. The number one issue is labor costs are going up. So no matter what else you take away from this message is the cost of employing labor and agriculture is going up. We're trying an historic experiment. We're going to go from $10 an hour minimum wage to $15 an hour minimum wage. And it doesn't look like under the president-elect we'll probably raise the federal minimum wage, although many states will. And what that means for California is that we are a state with enormous economic differences around the state. Los Altos in Silicon Valley is the richest city in the state. Fred, I picked out, what, which one did I pick out? Delano is not the poorest, but one of the poorest. There's almost, there's about an eight to one difference in average per capita income. But the, remember, the minimum wage is going to be the same throughout the state. 
What that means is that typically the medium wage means half of the people earn more and half of the people earn less. We're projecting in 2022 when the minimum wage is $15 an hour, the medium wage in Fresno is going to be $20 an hour. Typically, if the medium wage uh, is $20, the minimum wage would be 10. So the minimum wage is normally half of the median. We're going to have the minimum three quarters of the median. We don't know what that means. We don't know whether that means a whole lot of people are going to get a whole lot more money or there's going to be a lot fewer jobs. Give you one example. Um, this is the cost of renting a U-Haul to go between Houston and LA. And you probably can't see it, but it is a lot cheaper to move from Houston to LA. Uh, sorry, it is a lot cheaper to go from Houston to LA than it is from LA to Houston. I mean, Texas is actually created, has created about as many, they're the second largest state, as many jobs as us. So a little bit about immigration. Everything related to migration peaked in 2007. At the end of the building boom, the housing boom, we peaked at about 12 million unauthorized foreigners in the United States, roughly 60% came from Mexico. And the red bars here are migration from Mexico to the US. The blue is from the United States to Mexico. And what you can see is the blue is larger than the red for the most recent period. And why are people going to Mexico? Well, the biggest reason is we deport them. We deport well over 1,000 people a day. And so that means over 360,000 a year, and some people go on their own as well. Agriculture is a bit like the canary in the coal mine because agriculture hires newcomers from Mexico. And that then takes me to the main message today, which is how are farm employers responding to this slowdown in unauthorized migration? So the end of farm labor abundance, as Craig was saying. Well, the first thing is you try to satisfy the workers you've got. You start doing whatever it takes or do something to keep them there. The number one thing many people are doing is bonuses because bonuses you can pay one year and not the next. If you raise wages, it's hard to reduce them. Plus, raising wages at your farm might simply take people from other people's farms. One thing that some big groups have found is that training supervisors could do a lot to satisfy workers. As you know, first level supervision in, throughout the American economy is pretty bad because there's a lot of favoritism, there's a lot of perception that people aren't fair. One thing that people are trying to do, some people are trying to do, is, sat, is retrain supervisors. Stretching is where we put conveyor belts out there. Uh, up in the, in the Apple industry in Washington, they're trying to do hydraulic lifts. But the basic idea is, if you can reduce fruits and vegetables or over 90% water in most cases, if you can reduce the, reduce the lifting and carrying, the job becomes more attractive to older workers and women. How much can you stretch? How much do you want to invest to stretch? Those are the big question. Substitution is the mechanization wherever possible. Given that 50% increase in the minimum wage, that's probably a very smart strategy. But then the final one is supplement. You can get fresh blood through the H-2A program. And the question is, which way do you invest? Do you invest in machines? Do you invest in housing for H-2A workers? So the first one is satisfy. Unfortunately, the University of California, I don't think we do supervisor training. The University of Florida does. It is amazing to me always to see how much people appreciate certificates. The University of Florida is doing, you know, you have to do sexual harassment training for uh, crew bosses and stuff. It would be, it could be something that could be added on to try to improve the quality of supervision. The conveyor belts are this idea of you're, you're increasing the productivity of workers by reducing the lifting and carrying. How much further can that go? Well, there probably are a lot more commodities in which we could try to reduce lifting and carrying, which would make those jobs more attractive to older workers and women. The, there are a lot of issues with using, using productivity enhancements. For example, if you're picking into bags from ladders, then it's an individual piece rate. In the state of Washington, where they're going to hydraulic platforms, you've got to do a group piece rate. Sometimes that doesn't work out with workers. They prefer the individual. So there, it's not as if something is necessarily, it's not an easy thing to do, because remember, the piece rate often drops when you in, bring in a conveyor belt. And the question is, how should you share that productivity gain between the grower and workers? 
Mechanization is a big story. There's lots of venture capital money going into trying to develop machines for more commodities. The main issue has always been how do you get uniform ripening so that you can harvest once over? It's really difficult for a machine to do multiple passes. So how do you promote once over? One of the things to think about is Carnegie Mellon does a lot of work on robotics for the Defense Department. And if you visit their agricultural section in Pittsburgh, they say the number one thing to learn is when you're working for the military, it's all about performance. It doesn't matter if that robot costs you $500,000, if it saves one soldier. If you're working in agriculture, it's all about cost. It doesn't matter if you miss three apples. You just want to make sure that machine doesn't cost too much. And so it's, it's a cost versus performance issue. And that's why the little Harvey, the robot that moves plants around in nurseries, it has a very simplified structure. You, it's only about $30,000. It works 24-7. Supposedly, the payback is two and a half years. But the main lesson that came out of developing that is it's all about cost, not performance. Mechanization has really taken off. I mean, you, you all know the reasons why it's slower in some raisin grapes, because they weren't set up for mechanization. But clearly, any of you who are planting new vineyards for wine grapes are probably going to plant them so that they can be pruned mechanically, harvested mechanically, and everything else mechanically. So when commodities are growing, when the, when the acreage is growing, it's often easier to speed mechanization than when the acreage is stable. There has been an annual thing that Forbes does, and it draws more and more people every year. It's trying to bring uh, uh, venture capital money into developing machines to save labor in agriculture. And then finally, we come to supplementing the farm workforce with H-2A workers. So H-2A is a program that's been around since 1952 to allow farmers to hire foreign workers. The, the major commodity for most of that time was cutting sugarcane in Florida and picking apples on the East Coast. In the mid-90s, it switched to tobacco, and tobacco is still, harvesting tobacco with Mexican guest workers is still the number one activity. But the growth has been in California and Washington, so states on the West Coast. It's an East Coast program, and if you look, the, there's something, a super minimum wage called the adverse effect wage rate. And it's lower in the southeast than it is in the west. So the H-2A program is concentrated in Florida, in North Carolina, in Georgia, in states like that. That's where growers have housing, because one of the requirements is you have to provide free housing that's approved. And that's where most of the growers, uh, uh, that's where the program has been used most. But the growth has been in California. So in this state, we will be over 10,000 H-2A workers this year. That's not very much for 400,000 average annual slots. But the way in which the H-2A program came to California is a bit interesting. Remember, the most legal farm workforce in the country is right along the border. Why? Because a whole lot of workers live in Mexico and they commute into, Yuma, into the Yuma area on a daily basis at San Luis. And the Border Patrol doesn't have a lot to do, so they stop the buses. Now, there is a lot of borrowing of documents to get across. But if I borrow your documents and I'm not stopped by the Border Patrol, why stay in Yuma and risk it again? I'm going to keep going. So that workforce near the border is legal. And as the commuter workforce aged, many of the vegetable companies that also operate in Salinas said they started saying, we've got to use H-2A. And it's fairly easy to get low-cost housing in the border areas. So the vegetable companies really introduced H2A in a big way. And then once they got experience in the desert, when the labor came short in Salinas, they started moving into Salinas. So the expansion of H2A is really driven by the vegetable companies that worked in both the desert and the Salinas Valley. We may be going back to the future. Back in the 1950s, most farm workers were legal Mexican men who lived on the farm where they worked. They were called braceros. It may be that we're going back to exactly that same future in which most, maybe not most, but many farm workers live on the farm where they work. But they may not be Mexican men. They could come from somewhere else. TNA is a big vegetable company. 
They did something that's fairly rare in California. They built 800, it's not quite all finished, but they are gonna build 800 beds on their property to house workers. Now, wine grapes are a little different uh, in the sense that it's a different commodity, but you're basically hiring, as near as I can tell, from exactly the same labor pool as everybody else. So it's not a different labor pool. And most, of course, wine grapes are harvested mechanically, as I understand it, the biggest labor use is probably in pruning, and there are things that one can do to at least pr mechanically pre-prune. But the ham work in, in vineyards is primarily, as, as I understand, associated with high end, and many of those people are willing to pay whatever it costs. But the takeaway for wine grapes and any other commodity is, with the minimum wage going up at least 50%, plus overtime, plus pay, um, piece rate workers for the rest periods at average piece rate earnings, I mean, no matter how you cut it, labor costs are going to go up. And the irony of California, of course, is that the, the most valuable crops and typically the highest profit crops are in the coastal areas where the cost of living is highest. So the, as we move forward, whether it's with H-2A workers or anything else, the question is, how do you develop housing in high cost areas? Or would it be smarter to develop van pools or buses? Because we already know that there are you know, a significant number of workers who are doing one and two hour commutes from lower cost housing in Stockton to Napa or somewhere else to a coastal area. I'm gonna end with just a few words on the election. If you look at Mr. Trump's website, he had seven priorities, two of which dealt with the illegal migration. Build the wall, deport the 11 million foreigners. If you look at Mrs. Clinton's uh, website, she had 35 priorities, one of which was a comprehensive path to citizenship for unauthorized foreigners, and right under that was equal treatment for the LGBT community. So we know that the dependence of unauthorized, on unauthorized workers varies by state. In Nevada, 10% of all workers are unauthorized. Remember, it's 5% for the country as a whole. So Nevada has the highest share of unauthorized workers. California second, Texas is third. But agriculture has the highest share. So 8 million unauthorized workers, maybe a million in agriculture, probably 2 million in hotels and restaurants. So there are more unauthorized workers in construction or in hotels and restaurants than in agriculture. But hotels and restaurants employ 12 million people. Agriculture employs about 2.5 million. Construction employs 7 million. Agriculture is about 2.5 million. So the share is higher in agriculture, not the number, the share. My guess is we have about a million unauthorized in agriculture of a little over 2 million uh, total. I should say, your wine grape growers, I understand, this is the first time in modern history we've had a president-elect who has a winery, so we know what wine is gonna be served at White House steak dinners, it's the greatest, of course. He, supposedly, Mr. Trump does not drink, we'll see how that uh, uh, works out. What does he say on immigration? What he says is that his number one priority is going to be going after criminal aliens. We have roughly 11 million unauthorized foreigners in the United States. Somewhere between two and two and a half million have been convicted of US crimes. Now, the, the crime they've been convicted of varies. Sometimes it's a simple DUI, sometimes it's a DUI where somebody was hurt or killed. The first priority is going to be go after criminal, foreign, criminal aliens, and how? There used to be a program called Secure Communities that had state and local police tipping off the Department of Homeland Security whenever they encountered a suspected unauthorized worker or unauthorized foreigner, and Mr. Obama stopped that program. I suspect we're gonna see a lot more state and local police. So, you know, the, the issue was always, you're going after the criminal foreigner. Very few people disagree with that. But in the process of finding typically him, you'll run across unauthorized relatives, and you pick those so-called innocent unauthorized get taken as well. With the enforcement may come guest workers. Now the big issue that, that Mr. Trump addressed in the campaign was not agriculture, but H-1B. H-1B is a guest worker program for college graduates. 
And what some companies do is they fire their U.S. workers and replace them with Indian workers on H-1B. Disney did this. And they required their U.S. workers to train the Indian replacements as a condition of getting severance pay. Trump made a big deal about that's going to change under him. Whether that does or not, it sets the tone for H-2A. So what might happen on H-2A? Well, the recruitment is pretty much already pro forma. But the big thing to watch for is right now, most H-2A visas are 10 months. There, but some H-2A visas are three years for sheep herders. The dairy industry is typically excluded because they offer year-round jobs. But Mr. there's a bipartisan push in Congress to go for three-year visas and allow dairy to participate in H-2A. If that happens, what would change in the H-2A program? What might change is a new business model. We have two business models in the H-2A. In California and in Florida, we have a labor contractor model. You all know Fresh Harvest, Scaroni's operation, bringing in about 3,000 H. That's a, basically a super labor contractor model. You pay him, he does all the work. In Florida, it's similar. In North Carolina and Washington, it's an employer association model. The employer association brings them in, they move them from farm to farm. If we go to three-year visas, we could wind up seeing more workers come from Asia. 100 years ago, most workers in the fields were Chinese and Japanese, Punjabi. We, with a three-year visa, you might get people coming from Asia as opposed to Mexico. So keep that in mind. It's not as if we haven't had Asians in the fields before. I get a call every other week from somebody in China or Bangladesh saying, I've got workers, connect me with farmers. So keep in mind, the model could change. It's hard to predict the future, but it could change. So what, is, how do, what does this, all this mean? Well, farm workers aren't going away. Actually, average farm worker employment is up, not down, primarily because of the expansion of berries. The workers out there are aging. They're settled, they're aging, they're married, they have US-born children. Employers are responding to fewer Mexican uh, newcomers coming in with satisfying their current workers, stretching them, substituting with machines, and supplementing. It's hard to know which of those four S's is the right strategy because it will depend in part on exactly what happens in Washington. And at this point, that's hard to predict other than saying there likely will be more enforcement. There may be new guest worker rules. And the thing that I would urge you to keep your eye on is what happens to that three-year visa? If the three-year visa comes in, how does that change where I look for or to source farm workers? Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions and discussion.